And we're live. <laughs> I look like someone's hippie flower child, but that's fine. <laughs> Uh, if you can't see the eyes, I'm all right, y'all. Just driving in Texas. Right now, I'm in traffic, and like I've literally been reminiscing the last like couple, like I want to say about 30 minutes or so, because I took a social media break without intending to, and then I also deleted one of my Instagram accounts. So it's like I'm kind of starting over once again, but also like rebranding. But it's like I have a game plan this time. And so I was going through my videos that I've created so far and I didn't realize that this channel is almost about to be a year old. A year old with six, well, over 60 subscribers. I have so many videos, I make YouTube shorts and honestly I need to get back to it. Like it's so much fun doing content creation and then I've noticed that there's been an interest in my life as a graduate student at the HBCU which is awesome because I'm also a librarian at HBCU and I have some pretty cool stuff coming up because I did switch my major from English to business but not because I'm giving up the education route it's because of the program at, at my school they're completely revamping it and it's like I don't want to be in school this long I really didn't intend to go back to school I just wanted to seek more knowledge and it's like we kind of like when you work at a university they do allow the employees to have a discount if you take a class or two so it's like why not you know you could never stop learning and that's one thing I've learned honestly working in the archives my first archivist job the one thing I've learned one of the most important lessons I've learned especially through the alumni is that people kept pursuing education till they got a doctrine. They kept going because you could never stop learning. You could never have enough a knowledge and education on various topics. You could always expand yourself. You could always go into something different. I've, I've seen so many people like well, who are no longer living now, but it's like they went from they went from engineering to sciences to administration. It's is is wild, but it's like people was hardcore about their careers and about wanting to learn everything they needed to know. And what they did not know, or something new came out, they made sure to educate themselves. And then they went to a school, which is Prairie View, where they had these conferences at. And like you came here to train to learn about the latest mostly the latest like issues in education and agriculture and mechanics, which is now engineering, because back then it was mechan mechanical arts. So there's so much I have learned just diving into the art guys while also learning the value of education and how back then African-Americans, they really didn't have much, but at Prairie View, they are like their own little entity, honestly. And we are working towards honestly telling the history of the campus and so, Hopefully it's not distracting with the hard eyes. <laughs> As you can see the camera in the background. So I get, I get a little distracted sometimes. But like, hopefully we get to tell more of the amazing history of Prairie View and how the students really pursue education and how we can all just really keep going. No matter how old you are, you can still learn more. And so now that I am a business major, um, starting in the fall semester i'll be a business major i will definitely shoot more content attend more events on campus who knows i might join a club or two that would be kind of cool i have had the thoughts of joining a sorority but let's see first because i didn't join one as a as a bachelor degree student or undergrad sorry i said it like that I, i'm hungry uh now i can only join the graduate chapter so let's see how see how that goes but yeah with the um back to education sorry quick like let's go back around <laughs> it's um I, the one thing i've learned when it comes to working in archives and how i can tie in education which i've recently learned is how i could go for teaching with primary sources because every day i touch primary sources primary sources are materials that are handwritten like communication and documentation from the person's like you know mouth or hands or words it could be speeches, letters, newspaper, even newspapers. Like it has to be firsthand though. It can't be like a retelling because then that's a secondary source. Most secondary sources are the scholarly articles that students like seek out for research papers. 
those are secondary sources. That means that they had to go to another source in order to write that article. And literally my job is dealing with the original materials. That's the best thing about all of this. Yeah, as I was saying, this is the best part of dealing with primary sources and dealing with my field. I literally get to live like I'm in Night in the Museum, The Mummy, all of that, all day daily basis. Like I discover so much stuff. It is awesome. Don't worry guys, I'm driving, driving safe. While on these back roads of Hockley. <laughs> But yeah, uh, I'm honestly going to spend this summer kind of divulging into that a little bit, create some lesson plans on really like how to teach with primary sources because I've noticed like it is a huge community of K-12 educators wanting to learn more about the importance of primary sources and how to implement that in their curriculums. And it's like, whoa, I could do that as a, as a, you know, as a writer at heart and then like loving archival materials cultural preservation and now I get to tie in with education and even though I did not take many classes in education I did take one important class where I learned how to create a lesson plan a lesson unit so this summer on my YouTube channel and I will make it available as well for free for educators who are interested in the fall semester where you could teach primary sources and how those can tie into your curriculum and make sure you in you know you strive for student success I learned that much and I feel like that was enough for me to learn because I learned about the psychology of student learning and I took curriculum development. I feel like that was that was pretty good for, you know, my my, my first semester in education and then switching to business. Like that's more of a it's I, I feel like and everyone keeps telling me that it'll be more beneficial since I do own businesses and that I really am self taught, but I never actually like took a class. So the fact that I get to have this opportunity where my job will let me take a business class, I feel like I should in order to honestly have success in my business because I've already had to compromise my first business because it didn't do too well. I did not know much about marketing. I did not know much about social media and I wanted to learn more. And so it's like, now I get to take a class. All right, we're back up here. <laughs> Sorry, I was turning, hard turn. But um, yeah, I had to let go of my consulting business because I didn't have any clientele and I wasn't making money. And now I have both a notary business and book publishing, which it might be crazy to promote both at the same time, but the notary stuff is really just getting my name out there and getting with a company who will allow me to work with them, especially remotely. It's like I could do signings online. I made sure I got certified for that and loan signings to help people close on their houses. Most importantly, I made sure to create my own book publishing company because no matter if I sign with a traditional publisher or if I go sell publishing, it's like they recommend you to create your own LLC if you're going to self-publish. It's like, why not? And then it's like, I have this umbrella here in Texas on the EP Rights LLC and I created my book imprint, which is another business name I go by, or fictitious name is what they call it. It's Cupid Curls Press. And that's what's going to be in all my books moving forward. And I have decided to go ahead and publish one of my poetry books on my birthday this year. So as of, it's June 3rd right now. I plan on publishing this book on my birthday, December 11th, Wednesday. So I'll start the promotions for that as well. And really like showcasing me being a poet, like... I haven't shown too much of myself and I've been lacking with being consistent, but if I really want this to work, I need to show what I'm doing, but also be relatable in how I feel because that's really the name of the game. And I really do want to grow this personal brand with my audience because I mean, I do have people interested in YouTube and TikTok and I really feel like it I don't think people know about the lives of librarians. And I'm both an archivist and a librarian. So it's like, I get to have the best of both worlds. Like I could, re I could recommend you some books, but I could also decipher some old material artifacts that you have. That's pretty freaking cool. <laughs> Cause like I follow a couple of TikTokers that are, um, they're like certified antique 
you know, personnel. Like, I need to look up the uh, actual name of that. I know they have a title. It's, it's, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. I'm trying to get to Sam, pick up some groceries. But they do have people who are collectors. That's, that's what I'm going to call them, collectors. of so both artifacts, rare books, rare objects. People collect some of the most interesting things, but guess what? Like, that is what makes your collection special. And that's why... In my field, it's not just archives. It's also special collections. Because sometimes when a person decides to collect a certain type of materials or by a person, a group, or a company, like you could have like a whole bunch of Sherlock Holmes um, memorabilia. That's a special collection. You had an interest in it and is now either in an archive somewhere or it's displayed in a museum. And that's honestly the best part of my job is seeing what people collected. And I would love to show more of that too because I do have a video and I'm going to plug it here of a day in life of an archivist and what I go through on a daily basis. And honestly, I think another reason I took an unexpected break from social media is the fact that I manage a seven person team doing project management with no experience. I just had somewhat of a game plan or revised the assessment that was given to me and I was like, okay, if everything goes like how I expect it to, it should go well and that was in late february early march it is now june and my plan has came to fruition and i actually executed exactly what i wanted to do and honestly i'm gonna take off the glass for this that was probably the most rewarding thing that a person with no experience in a certain field which is project management i came up with a plan and executed that plan and was able to get the resources to get us get us the supplies to preserve the materials and that's amazing and now i'm at the end of my plan and everything is coming together and it's beautiful and we continue to make collections available that's another best part of my job because so many Perryview alumni and faculty I know they would just love to know what's in their archives, what history is being preserved. And I want to share that with you guys and my audience, but most definitely share the side of being a graduate student. But yeah, so this is not to really spoil any education majors at Prairie View, but it's like the changes that are happening right now, I just can't deal with that. I, <sighs> they have that type of weight and then we're approaching a very important aspect of history it's like do I really want to spend all my time having to do electives and then play catch up on the um, core classes or should I just switch my program and just finish it in the two years that that, it, that the program said that it'll allow me to be done so that's the route I decided to go but I'm still pursuing education with teaching primary sources TPS you can look it up that's something that I'm actually pursuing right now, moving forward in implementing education into archives. And so I'm gonna close this video and probably get, stop holding this phone because my hands are to hurt now. <laughs> Where um, I'm not going to drop off the face of the earth again. Can't do that. I know that my last video was like a month ago until I post like a little short about Houston, we have a problem. And it's like, yeah, I went through quite a bit, but I'm okay now. And I did an assessment on myself and it's like, okay, you have a game plan, you have the resources, and most importantly, you finally have the financial aspect to finally self-publish. I have been waiting for this moment for so many years. And it honestly took me meeting an old friend to be like, the very first thing she asked me was, do we have a bestseller yet? And I was like, whoa, <laughs> just to meet someone that like literally like because we lost contact and she moved away to meet someone that remember your dream. It's like, I got to do this now. And so I have six months from today to get this accomplished and I know I can do it and you can do it too. So let's see how this is going to go moving forward. And I did want to do like a mini notary series on my Instagram, which is W Houston underscore notary of how a moving to Texas series. Let me know if anyone's interested in that because like I know the weather has been kind of cuckoo, but uh, I'm so interested in showing like how I moved to Texas and really what is the best way to go about, it, especially if you have a lease car. But definitely let me know in the comment section and don't forget to like, comment and subscribe if you want to learn about the lives of librarians. <laughs> See you next time.